Well, I guess it's time. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ivan Uglianski, and today I'd like to tell you about garbage collection in JVM, and more precisely about some problems related to GC, like unexpected null pointer exceptions or out-of-memory errors because of so-called zombie objects in memory. First of all, just a couple of words about myself. I'm from a rather distant place. I'm from Siberian region in Russia. And the last seven years, I worked for Excelsior company that was specialized on making compilers and virtual machines, including those for Java. So basically, I'm a JVM, JVM engineer. And more precisely, I usually work for some runtime subsystems like garbage collectors, uh, profilers, and etc. cetera. Um, so today, we'll, we'll talk about garbage collection, actually. And you know, we all love Java and other managed languages for many nice features, right? But I think that one of the main features is actually automatically memory management system. And that also includes garbage collection. And actually, every Java developer has some sort of intuitive understanding of how exactly GC should work. We all know that we shouldn't delete objects manually, but instead we can delegate this task to our friend, garbage collector. That in some point in the future will come and collect objects that have become useless for your program, right? So it looks like really cool, but also simple concept. But now let's understand what exactly is said, is said about garbage collection in our holy Bible, the JVM specification book. And surprisingly, it says almost nothing about GC. The only thing there is that is this small paragraph where it says that, yes, you shouldn't delete objects manually, and yes, some sort of memory management system should be implemented in the JVM. But basically, that's all. There are no details, no approaches or strategies for garbage collection there, uh, because all these are just some implementation details, and the corresponding decisions should be made by the JVM vendors. So what does it mean in the real life? Well, for us as JVM developers, it's actually a great news because it means that we can implement any GC algorithm we want. The only limitation here is that it shouldn't violate correctness, and we shouldn't collect objects that will be used in the, your program in the future. But in all other means, we have absolutely freedom of choice. But on the other hand, it's also a great news for you as Java developers, because it means that you shouldn't think about such low-level things like memory manager at all, and you can concentrate on some high-level decisions in your Java code. So, in, in theory, everything works just fine, and both of these worlds can coexist in some balance. But it's theory. And in practice, you can run your Java application and suddenly get something like that. Null pointer exception in the very middle of execution, and even if you're absolutely sure that all objects are in their places and null pointer is just impossible here. Or you can get this one, out of memory error, if you even if you've set XMX option to the really great value. Or, if you're lucky enough, you can even get something like that. It's already a crash of JVM, and it says that you don't have enough native memory. And the worst thing here is that all these errors can be sporadic and do not reproduce at every run. Actually, there can be different reasons for such problems, for example, some bugs in JVM implementation in our code, but more often the problem is uh, placed in Java code. Uh, because sometimes Java developers try to predict GC actions um, and rely on such predictions in their Java code. More precisely, they try to guess when exactly GC will come and collect their dead object. And as you remember, JVM specification says almost nothing about that. And of, and of course, there is no answer to this question there. And that's why this answer can be different from one JVM implementation to another, and even for different GCs inside the same JVM. So, of course, if you rely on such uh, some answers for this question, you can get such sporadic and really hard to debug problems. So, in my talk, I'd like to tell you some real life examples of similar problems, uh, discuss how dangerous it can be for your application, and tell you about some instruments, tools, and approaches how to notice and fix such problems. So, let's go. And let's start with solving a small puzzle. Here we have a really tiny piece of Java code. It's about only eight lines of code here. And first of all, we allocate an array here, which size is at least a half of gigabyte. Then we use it somehow, for example, passing to system out print align method, and then we invoke system GC method, asking our JVM to collect garbage right now. Then again, allocate another array. Again, it size at least, is at least a, a half of gigabyte, and then use it somehow. And now let's run 
this sample on Haspel JVM, but also specify XMX option, limiting our heap with three quarters of gigabyte. So the question is, what will actually happen here? And it looks like there are only two options, because both of these arrays just cannot coexist in memory at the same time. And that's why either out of memory will be thrown during the second allocation, or GC will somehow magically solve this problem. So let's vote. Who actually believes in GC and thinks that everything will work fine there, as there will be no problems, no er errors? Oh, <laughs> at least one. All right. It's good to know that somebody believes in your work. Uh, <laughs> and who, who actually feels a little bit skeptic today and thinks that out of memory will be thrown? Oh, all right. So let's see. We run our application, and yes, we have out of memory during the second allocation. It's a little bit disappointing, but wait. Let's rerun our application, and this time let's add new minus xcomp option that forces our JVM to compile all methods instead of interpreting them. And suddenly, such configuration will help. Uh, we do not have any out of memory errors here, and everything works fine. And actually, it's a little bit strange because, you know, it wasn't a runtime option, it wasn't a GC option, it was just a compile mode option. So, how can it help us to avoid out of memory here? Oh, well, let's find out. For that, we should actually answer the only question Can GC collect the first array during this call of system GC method? And rather popular opinion here is that, is that no, it can't. Because, uh, you know, all GCs should respect correctness, and that's why we shouldn't collect objects that could be used in your program in future. But here we have a local variable, R1, that points to our array in memory, and it means that until it exists, we shouldn't touch our array, right? And when we're talking about the existence of local variable, we usually think about visibility scope. And from this point of view, this variable is alive up to the end of our method, and that's why we actually just can't collect the first array during systemgc, and yes, throwing out of memory is quite a logical choice here. But fortunately, all modern compilers, including Java compilers, calculate something much more interesting than just uh, visibility scope of variables. And I'm talking about a live range of local variables. Life range is just a set of operations from the definition and up to the last use. And uh, in our sample, it's just these two instructions in green area. Um, and of course, it's also a great idea for GC to rely on life ranges instead of visibility scope. Because, because if the variable is dead, you just cannot access the object. And that's why it's just the perfect time for GC to come and collect it. So actually, this happened uh, in, in our second run with minus xcomp option, because as you can see, systemgc is out of life range of uh, R1 variable. So the last question here is why our original run without minus xcomp option failed without of memory. How do you think? And the reason is actually an interpreter, because our method is rather cold, and that's why it hasn't been yet compiled with virtual machine, but still interpreted. And the interpreter has absolutely no idea about live ranges of variables, because its only job is to run your code as fast as possible without any optimizations or analysis. And that's why it has to extend the live range of variable R1 up to the worst possible scenario. And as a result, it will become as long as the visibility scope, and GC has no right to collect the first array. So, as you can see, even this such small eight lines Java sample can provoke so, some non so obvious uh, questions about GC behavior. But now let's go further and discuss some real life examples in our first story about so called ghost objects. Well, after the previous sample, it may seem that interpreters are really bad because they do not care about life ranges of variable, and since that's why they, they can cause some problems with memory manager. But that's not true. And to prove that, let's invert our previous sample with help of weak references. Weak references are a really interesting concept in Java. It allows you to have some special kind of references, and if the object is reachable only through such weak references, GC has its own right to come and collect it. This idea is implemented via uh, classes from Java Landcraft package, like weak reference, so soft reference, and phantom reference. And all these classes have a special field referent that is actually handled by GC in non standard manner. But what is important for us is that such weak references can get rotten. I mean, you can have a weak reference, and if the object is reachable only 
through such weak references, GC can come, collect it, and place null value to all reference fields of such weak references. And as a result, there will be some ghost references that had pointed to the object in the past, but now just contain null. So now let's invert our previous sample with help of weak references. Uh, here we allocate one object, and then we wrap it with weak reference. And please note that it was the last use of this local variable obj. Then we again call system GC method, and then let's try to access this object via this weak reference. For example, we will call get method, get reference field, and invoke the hash code method for, from the return value. So the question is again what will happen here, and the answer again depends on the options. This time, if we'll run without any options, everything will work correctly without any errors, and some valid hash code will be printed. However, if you'll add minus six comp option, null pointer exception will be thrown during this call of hash code method. And the reason is also absolutely the same. Interpreter has no idea about life ranges, that's why we keep an object alive up to the end of the method, but this time it saves us from null pointer, because uh, indeed, uh, during the invoking of hash code method, the object is in its place. However, the compiler tells the GC that we've already left uh, the life range of opt variable, and that's why this object is weakly reachable, and that's why we can collect it, but in our case, it will cost null pointer exception in the last line. All right, but now you can say, yes, maybe it's interesting, but what about promised real-life examples? I mean, it was just two hello worlds, and I bet no one will write something like that in their production code, right? We also were sure about that. And then, after several changes in our code that were not directly connected with memory manager, we suddenly faced up with something like that. Another null pointer exception, it's sporadic, and it's not so obvious why it happened, actually. We first decided that there is some, uh, some problem in our memory manager, but then uh, it appears that the, there is indeed problem, but not in our code, but in GDK class, and more precisely, in the GDK class resource bundle, and in this method get bundle impl. Here we have a class loader, it's just an argument of our method, and in the very beginning of this method we create an instance of cache key class, which is actually just a weak reference around this class loader. And the very important moment here is that it was the last use of this loader variable. However, there are some uses of the corresponding class loader object first in this method via this weak reference. So, as you can see, it's just the same situation as in our small sample. And, but it's not sample anymore, it's just a class from JDK. And you can reproduce this problem by yourself. Just take the some 8 version of JDK, it's really important, important to take the 8 version, and then invoke get bundle method with some valid arguments. And after several iterations, you also get this um, unexpected null pointer exception. So what you, can you do to avoid such problems in your production code? Well, first of all, first general advice is that you should always check whether uh, the reference field of weak reference has been no yet nullified or not. And if so, you should recalculate this value and use this new version of object. Uh, it's some sort of common se sense advice, actually, but unfortunately, it's not always possible. For example, in our previous example, we just cannot recalculate class loader. We just need to use this class loader and load some classes, and we have no idea how to get another class loader. That's why sometimes we need to keep an object alive in memory. And actually, it doesn't look like a gr great problem, because, for example, in our small program, we can, you know, add the use of this local variable obj at the end, and then we extend a uh, life range of obj variable up to the visibility scope, and the problem is solved. However, the interesting question here is how exactly should we use this object, and what is even more interesting, how to convince a compiler not to eliminate or remove this new artificial use. I mean, of course, you can pass, it, pass this uh, local variable as an argument to some lightweight method, or you can uh, put it in a static field of some class, but it's not guaranteed that these uses will help, because compiler just loves to remove some unuse, uh, unnecessary uses, and it can. It, do it for, to, to optimize your performance. So if you really want to keep an object alive, you should use a special method, reachability fence, that was introduced in GTK9, and its only goal is to keep an object alive. So in our small sample, you can just add this uh, invoke of reachability fence method, uh, pass our object variable there as an argument, and yes, it's guaranteed that the problem is solved there. 
By the way, the problem is solved in resource bundle class in JDK by just uh, the same the same instrument in, GD in GDK9. Uh, here, the code is a little bit refactored, and instead of uh, class loaders, we have some models here because, you know, it's Java 9, there are models there. Uh, but the, the main idea is just the same. We still have some weak reference at the very beginning of the method, but now we have two invokes on reachability fences at the end of this method. And that's why it's guaranteed that both of these models will be keep, kept in memory. So, several thoughts to summarize this first story. First of all, please pay attention that to the fact that GC has full right to collect an object uh, just after the last use of the corresponding local variable, and of course, before the end of its visibility scope. If you want to keep an object alive in memory, uh, you can try to make some artificial uses, but you should also take into account the fact that the compiler itself has, has some sort of uh, free will, and that's why he can eliminate or move these uses. So please use reachability fence. Uh, it was introduced in GDK9, so it's another reason to move from old versions like GDK8 to GDK9 and above. All right, and now let's talk about co something completely different, about walking dead objects. Here we have absolutely opposite problem. We have some really dead objects. They're reachable from nowhere. You just cannot access them in their code. But in some reason, GC just doesn't want to collect them. And you know, actually, developing your own GC algorithm is always a sort of trade-off. You have to choose between the performance of uh, your collector, known as throughput, and memory footprint of your applications. For example, you can imagine a really uh, fast garbage collector that uh, collects no less or even no garbage. And there is even such collector, it, it even exists, it's called Epsilon GC. Uh, please note that it doesn't violate specification because it doesn't touch some objects uh, that will be used in your program in the future. But still, of course, the standard Java application will work really fast with Epsilon GC, but it also will throw an out of memory really fast. On the other hand, you can imagine garbage collectors that will be invoked before every new operator. And this time, uh, your, your heap will be really well compacted, but of course, everything will work terribly slow. Usually, this trade-off is solved in favor of throughput, and there is even a special metric for GC algorithms known as memory drag. It describes how much memory was not wasn't clean at this GC cycle, but dragged to the next one, or may maybe to some future GC cycle in favor of immediate performance and throughput. So it's actually okay that not all your dead objects are cleared immediately after they become unreachable. However, if too much memory is dragged, then you can have some problems with uh, memory management because full your memory will be fulfilled with such so-called zombie objects. They are reachable from nowhere, you just cannot access them, but still they cause some problems with memory manager because, for example, you just cannot allocate another object because all your memory is consumed by such zombies. Moreover, some Java mechanisms, for example, weak references can work poorly because of them, because, you know, uh, even weakly reachable zombies do not actually die. So, there are several ways how you can accidentally increase memory drag of your uh, Java application. And maybe the brightest example is excessive use of finalization mechanism in Java. I guess everyone knows that there is a special method uh, in object class known as final finalize. And you can override this method in any class, and it's guaranteed that it will be called before the actual death of the object, so before it will be collected by GC. Uh, however, in GDK 9, Fortunately, it was deprecated. And now there is a huge and scary commentary before this method in object class. It says that there are some problems, uh, that finalization is uh, problematic from the start, it can cause some problems with performance, with, with hangs, with deadlocks, and many other problems. And the main idea here is that you should just stop using finalization. And that's great. I absolutely agree with this statement, and it's cool that it was deprecated. But now let's see how this words from this big and scary commentary uh, corresponds to the real life. For example, let's analyze the classes from the JDK and understand how many non-trivial, I mean non-empty finalized methods are implemented there. Well, in JDK 8, there were 89 occurrences of non-trivial finalized methods there. In JDK 9, when it was deprecated, there were 87 occurrences. In JDK 11, the, our last long-term support version, there are 84 occurrences. 
So yes, uh, the situation slowly improving, and yes, some finalized methods are removing, but today we have some finalized methods, and we need to understand how we should live with them. Um, how actually finalization is connected with our zombie objects directly? Because instances of classes with not real finalized methods survive longer than others. And the reason is of such behavior is actually uh, the implementation of finalization mechanism in JVM. Uh, finalized are just Java methods, right? And that's why they should be executed in some Java thread. And usually there is a special thread finalizer in JVM which should execute these uh, finalized methods. But if you have stopped the world collector, first thing you want to, to do to collect garbage is to suspend all Java threads, including this finalizer thread. And that's why during this pause, you just even if there are some objects uh, that could be collected, but uh, their finalized methods are not yet executed, you just cannot collect them. And that's why uh, you mark them in a special way, then you resume all Java threads, and then finalizer thread will continue uh, uh, executing these finalized methods. So at least one cycle, uh, all these objects will be alive at least for one cycle longer. But please, uh, take into account the fact that uh, the finalizer thread itself has some sort of throughput, and that's why some objects can stack in memory much longer until finally it's their turn and their finalized method is finally executed. It's already a grave news, but it's not the worst. And the worst can be demonstrated with such really small sample. Here we have some full class, and we have non-trivial finalized method, and we also have, have a reference field ref here. And we use this reference field in our finalized method. And now it looks like we shouldn't collect not only the instance of this full class before the finalization is actually executed, but also the object that is pointed by this ref method. And the worst here is that modern JVM implementations makes a conservative assumption that every object reachable from uh, the instance of full class should survive uh, GCs until this finalized method is finally executed. This subset of uh, objects is called a reachables, and it's really a grave problem for memory manager because they consume dozens of megabytes and even gigabytes, and that's why you can just invoke some out of memory because too many objects are now waiting for finalizations there. So the, the first question for us is how actually we can understand that out of memory was in, invoked because of these uh, um, fin objects that were waiting for finalization. You can easily find it out with help of special JMAP tool. It's a part of JDK, so you can just run it uh, and add special option minus finalizer info, and also pass a piece for your Java process there as an argument. And as a result, there will be a list of all objects that are waiting for finalization just at the moment. And if there are some dozens of thousands uh, of elements there, maybe you have some problems with finalization that should be solved. But how can we solve these problems? Well, usually we use finalization to clear some low-level resources, like OS handles or maybe file descriptors. And that's why usually the structure of the class with not real finalized methods looks like that. You have some low-level resources, uh, you use them as finalized methods, but there are also some reference fields that are not used as finalized methods. And the main idea here is to create a separate class state, move all resource fields there, uh, create, uh, move uh, the finalized methods there as well, and in the original class just store the reference to this new class. And as a result, you still have a problem with finalization, but uh, the size of a reachable set is much more compact, so it's not so grave problem for memory manager. But of course, the best idea is just to stop, stop using finalization, as it was said in that big and scary commentary. But we still need some replacement for that, because we need to clear some level resources, right? And as a replacement, I suggest to use this wonderful class, Java Lang Ref Cleaner from JDK. Its only purpose is to replace finalization, and it's implemented via phantom references. And to use it, you should just almost do, do just almost the same steps. You should create a separate class state, uh, you should move all resources fields there, but this time, instead of creating finalized method, you should just make it uh, the implementation of runnable and place all this uh, logic for clearing resources in your run method. Also, when you create an instance of full class, you should register it in some cleaner object, and that's then when it become, becomes uh, phantom reachable, the clearing actions will uh, proceed. So the cleaner class is really a great replacement for finalization and solves many problems from that big scary commentary, but please know that it also solves problems with memory drag, our problems, only since GDK 9. 
The reason is full rework of, of phantom references in GDK 9. Uh, you can read more details in this ticket on OpenGDK bug tracker. Uh, but the main idea is that it will help us only since 9 and GDK 9 and above. So several thoughts about second story. First of all, using finalization can dram dramatically increase your memory drag. And the worst here is that you cannot control that. For example, you can inherit your class from some platform or library class with non trivial finalized method, and here you are. You have some problems with finalization. In theory, JVM implementations can try to handle this problem by themselves. For example, they can calculate the, this appreciable set much more accurate. But unfortunately, the main idea today is that it's really great that uh, finalization is deprecated, that, and that's why we shouldn't do anything today. In some maybe distant future, uh, finalized method will disappear and the problem is solved. So today, um, instead of finalization, I suggest you to use a Java Link Ref Cleaner class that will help to solve your problems. All right, now let's go further and talk about another really interesting phenomena connected with memory drag that's called nepotism of garbage collectors. And here, let's see another small sample Java class. This time is some sort of linked list, but with very reduced functionality, and that's why it's called like that. And here we have the reference to the first element, the reference to the last one, and every element has also a reference to the next element. So just some sort of linked list. We also have add last method here that actually inserts new element to the end of our list. And what's a little bit more interesting for us is the remove first element that obviously removes the first element from our list. It's more interesting for us because of how exactly deleting of this element is, ex is implemented. Uh, we have a language with automatically memory manager, right? And that's why we shouldn't delete this object, actually. We, we just can make it unreachable by redirecting some references. And then at some point in the future, GC will come and collect our previous head of our linked list. So it looks like some correct implementation of linked list, but this implementation can cause some problems with memory drag, with zombie objects. And this time it will ruin the performance and latency of your Java application. And the most interesting fact here is that the reason is the coolest optimi optimization of garbage collection, knows, known as generational GCs. Generational GCs are based on really interesting uh, hypothesis that's known, gen known as generational hypothesis. It says that almost all Java objects die young, just, just after several cycles after they were born. And also, if some objects survive the several cycles, they're actually long levers, and they can, can survive up to the very end of your application work. And based on this thought, all Java objects are divided into two parts. The young generation, where all objects are actually born, and the old generations, where these long levers are evacuated after these several cycles. All GC cycles are also divided into two parts. Minor GCs that work actually incredible fast because they scan only this young generation. And major GCs uh, that scan the old generation as well, that's why they work much slower, but they work only in some rare cases when you do not have another choice, for example, if you do not have another memory for location. And the only thing that you could, should take into account during these minor GCs, uh, you should track all references from the old generation to young one. Because, you know, during minor GC, we suppose that all elements in all generation are alive. And that's why all elements reachable from them should also survive the GC cycle. And that's why we have to track these references. So let's see how exactly um, our dummy list will work with generational GCs. First of all, we create an instance of dummy list. Then it survives several GC cycles. And then it's evacuated to the old generation, just as planned. Then we add another element, the first element of our list. It appears in young generation and survives its first GC cycle. Then several more elements are added, and then several more GC cycles appear. And then the first element is recognized as a long lever and evacuated to the old generation. And at this point, everything works just fine. This is just how generational GCs should work. But then we delete our first element. And as just discussed, it just becomes unreachable, right? And then we delete some more elements. And then GC comes. But instead of deleting this element, it just keeps them in memory. Because, you know, it was a minor GC, and all objects from all generation and all reachable from them should survive this GC. This situation is called the nepotism of garbage collector, because how one old object can actually uh, keep some young objects in memory, young dead objects. And the worst, the worst 
thing here is that after this GC, these dead objects can be evacuated to the old generations. And that's why this problem is also called floating garbage, because how dead objects can float from one generation to another. So it looks like generational GCs consciously increases their memory drag with the size of this old generation and all objects reachable from them. And that's actually the price uh, for this really fast minor GCs. And usually it's okay, but sometimes this old generation can become just a source of walking dead objects because more and more objects will be evacuated to the old generation and eventually your old generation will consume all your memory and you will have to uh, invoke full GCs. That's really, really slow. So now you can say it's another hello world and no, no one writes some self-crafted linked list, right? So who cares? But that's not actually right because the, the nepotism of garbage collector can be a really grave problem for Java applications. And there are many, many real life examples of such problems. But my favorite one is a story from Tony Prentezes uh, about how they fought with nepotism of linked hash map and Twitter. So we can follow this link and there is really video of one of the previous uh, devoxes. Uh, from with his talk, and it's really interesting and in informative. However, now we should understand how we can notice a problem with nepotism in production in our code. Uh, well, it's not, it, it can be tricky because there are no direct signs of nepotism and you should find some indirect ones. For example, if you understand that your application hangs from time to time without any obvious reason, it's the best time for you to go and uh, read some GC logs. You can get them with print GC details option, and if you see that there are some periodically invoked full GCs there, then maybe it's nepotism. And you should also scan the heap dump of all the live objects. You can get it with, again, JMAP tool, but this time use minus dump option. And if there are too many instances of some linked structures there, yes, it's a nepotism. You, you should fight with that. But how can we fight with nepotism? Well, first of all, we should say that nepotism is not so fatal problem. You can always wait until full Gibson will come, the sun will rise, and just burn all your zombie objects to ashes. But unfortunately, in our world of low latency Java applications, it's just not always possible because full GC is terribly slow. As an alternative, you can try to fight with nepotism manually. You can try to manually nullify references of such deleted elements. It can sound a little bit strange and counterintuitive because usually we try to nullify references to these deleted elements to make it unreachable. But let's see how exactly linked list is implemented in JDK and how it differs from ours. And the only difference is this, this line where we actually nullify this next reference for deleting element. And please note this really interesting commentary here. It's some sort of help for GC. And this is actually the help for GC for finding nepotism. So absolutely the same story. So you should also nullify elements of such deleted nodes in your linked collections. But in, if in some reason you just can't or do not want to modify your collections, there is a third path for you. You can try to solve this problem with just tuning the size of young generation with help of XMN option. I mean, the bigger size of uh, young generation is, uh, the later will be the moment when long levers will be evacuated. And that's why it actually can help you to avoid this problem because uh, maybe they just will die before the evacuation and the problem, problem is solved. But of course you should be very careful because the bigger the size of young generation is, the longer minor GC takes and it actually ruins the idea of generational GCs. All right, we just discussed several stories. And in all these stories, the problem was that some GC actions were delayed because some finalized, me finalized methods or maybe some uh, strategic decisions of virtual machine. And now let's discuss something much more fatal. For example, let's understand, can GC just ignore an object at every GC cycle? In other words, is a zombie object apocalypse actually possible in your Java application? And the answer is yes, of course. And it's. Uh, topic of my last story about the conservatism of garbage collectors. Let's revisit our very first sample with two arrays and now discuss some technical uh, issues. For example, how exactly GC should understand uh, where local variables are placed during this, this call of system GC method. I mean, usually we are talking about compile code, right? And in compile code we have registers and stack slots and all local variables are already placed there. 
And that's why GC, first of all, should understand which registers and stack slots contain reference to a life objects, then mark corresponding to objects as root objects, and all reachable from them should be considered alive, and all others are just garbage to collect. So it looks like GC needs to understand where exactly uh, he should find this uh, alive life references in registers and stack slots. And where can we get such information during runtime? And the obvious answer is to ask a compiler, because actually compiler is a guy who map all our local variables on stack slots and uh, registers. And that's why he can generate special structures known as GC maps, uh, or maybe stack and register maps, with all needed information. And GC will be consulting with such structures uh, during the marking phase. Of course, if such structures were generated just uh, for every instruction in your Java code, it will, would be just a colossal amount of data. And that's why they're generated only for special points known as safe points. This approach is rather popular, and almost all JVM implements such garbage collection that's, that's called precise GC, because we know precisely where local variables are situated. However, we are inside the JVM, right? We know so many different things. For example, we understand how allocation works. We know how objects are looked in memory. We know the layout. We know the uh, alignment of ref pointers and so on. So the interesting question here is, can we implement our garbage collector without hints from the compiler? And the answer is yes. And the alternative approach is known as conservative GC, because we assume the worst here, that every value on the stack and in registers can be a pointer to the, some object in memory. And then we just filter out all incorrect values uh, during runtime with help of our knowledge about allocation scheme. With this approach, we of course will find all root objects that were found by precise GC, but also there is a chance that there will be some value on the stack that will pass all our checks, but still point to some dead object. And in this case, this dead, dead object and all reachable from them will survive this GC cycle. But we can be absolutely okay with that, because this situation is called uh, the conservative mistake, and yes, it will increase your memory drag, but we already know that some GCs can increase their memory drag with the size of, with the size of whole generation of objects, and they're okay with that. So we also will be okay with increasing memory drag for, for, for the size of conservative mistake. But why should anyone do something like that with their GC algorithm? Well, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, if you do not need hints from the compiler, then you shouldn't generate these GC maps and spend time for generating and storing these uh, maps. And it's really a great, great thing, especially for just-in-time compilers. But what is even cooler is that without GC maps, you have one less reason to insert these save points in your virtual machine. And usually save points are generated into one or two native instructions that work quite slow because they work with memory. And what's even worse, we have to put, in, put the save points rather often because we should guarantee us that every Java thread uh, can uh, reach the nearest save points rather fast. So usually they are placed at every backward branch of every loop and in the epilogue of every method. But of course, this standard approach will just ruin the performance of every Java application. And of course, that's why it's uh, just a great headache for JVM implementations. And we try to remove as many save points as possible. With, some, with help of some optimizations, uh, analysis, uh, heuristics, and etc., And removing even some save points from hot method is a really great achievement for the compiler. But now, imagine the world without a single save point in the generated code. In such wonderful world, each and every Java application will work much faster. And the difference in performance will be from 10 to 15%. And it doesn't matter whether your application generates some garbage to collect. It doesn't depend on the garbage collection anymore. Every Java application will be accelerated. What's more, the size of generated code will be much more compact because you just remove the save points. It's just a couple of instructions, but there are many save points. So yes, it will be compacted. So it looks great, actually. But Someone can say that it's just impossible to remove all save points from your uh, JVM because too many mechanisms are based on these save points. And it's just a half truth because, yes, there are some mechanisms based on save points, but it doesn't mean that you cannot reinvent them or implement without save points. It's just a matter of resources, time, and motivation. And we have motivation because everything will be accelerated. All right, so now it becomes interesting, right? And the question is, is it actually possible to implement, to implement such conservative GC? 
And the answer is yes again, because first of all, we have some scientific papers about conservative GCs, and what's even more interesting for us is that there are some real life projects with conservative GCs. For example, there, is, there was actually a rather interesting project, RoboVM, it's running uh, Java on iOS. Unfortunately, it's closed now, thanks to Microsoft, but there are some open source successors, like for example, MobiVM, so you can still run your Java on iOS, and they use conservative GCs there. Moreover, there is a really interesting project, Scala Native. It's just implementation of Scala language without the JVM. And they also need to implement the runtime, right? And that's why they also implement GC, and they prefer conservative GCs. Finally, the previous version of our virtual machine, Excel Short Jet, uh, that worked on x86 architecture, had a conservative GC from the very beginning in 1999 and up to 2015. And it was a real conservative GC without a save points. And that's why this difference in performance for application with and without save points is not just a theory. I saw it with my own eyes. But in 2015, we finally implemented precise GC. And actually, the question is why is the conservative GC is so great? But unfortunately, Usually, conservative mistake increases your memory drag just for one or maybe several GC cycles until this full, thre full root value is still on the stack. But sometimes, and it's possible, that this conservative mistake will increase your memory drag forever. And it will actually uh, cause unlimited memory consumption, and this is the first step for zombie objects apocalypse. I will demonstrate it in a really small and simple Java, uh, Java program again. Here we have some class executor, it's just uh, some thread, which only job is to look to this queue with tasks to gather new, new task and just execute it. So whole logic is the logic of this uh, class is here. We have some loop here, we wait until another task appears, we just get it with get method, and then we run it. And that's all. And now let's see how exactly this code will work with our conservative GC. Here we have a local variable t, and that's why there is a reference to this task object on the stack. And that's why this object and all objects reachable from it will survive this GC cycle. And it's totally okay here. The situation is the same during the call of run method, but then we go back, and here we wait for another task, but we still have a reference to the previous task on the stack. It's already dead. But the conservative GC has no idea about that, and it just sees, sees that there is some reference on the stack, and that's why all these objects will survive this GC cycle. So the question is, how long can we wait until this false root will be erased from the stack? And the answer is, we do not know. Because actually, we can long for arbitrary long time for another task, and that's why we will increase our memory drag forever. Here we have a last and really big hope that maybe this is our, the artificial example and no one will write something like that in production. But of, of course it's not like that. It was just a part of Java Util Timer class from JDK actually, and the situation is even worse there. Because among these objects reachable from the stack, there is a special object there that's called Threadripper. And the only purpose of this object is to kill the, the executor thread itself. And this idea is implemented via finalization. And when thread reaper becomes unreachable, the execute, the, its finalizer thread, finalized method is executed, and the executor thread itself is killed. But in our case, thread reaper, thread reaper object will never be unreachable because we always have some reference on the stack to the previous dead task. And that's why every time you use timer class, you'll get some conservative mistake and extend your memory consumption for some dozens of megabytes. So, of course, it's some sort of zombie apocalypse that will cause out of memory rather soon. So, how can you in your Java code fight with conservatism of garbage collectors? Well, let's be honest, it doesn't look like the problem of Java developers, right? It's like uh, the problem of JVM developers. So if you have some uh, virtual machine with conservative GC, the best idea is to change it or maybe wait until they implement the precise GC like we did. But on the other hand, the problem with timer cancel was so disastrous because of finalization again. Because all the scheme of killing executor threat was implemented by a finalized method. And if you will not use such uh, techniques like finalization or other mechanisms that are based on the death of the object, su such problems will not be so disastrous, maybe. And actually, the author of timer 
class understands it really well. And in this huge Java doc before uh, timer class, it says that yes, we wait until the object is dead and it can take arbitrary long time. So if you're in a hurry, please use the special timer cancel method that will kill this uh, thread immediately. So if you're making something like that and you're relying on the death of object, maybe just at least have this backup path method uh, that will allow people with conservative GC just to, 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 to run their application without out of memories. All in all, conservative GCs are rather cool because they allow you to remove uh, save points and accelerate every application. But of course, with great power, the great responsibility comes. And yes, it's possible that there will be unlimited memory consumption there. But I, I think that in not so distant future, conservative GCs will be much more popular in Java world because the possibility to remove save points is too alluring. And another moment here is that not only GC can be conservative. I mean, let's revisit our very first sample with two arrays. And we also got an out-of-memory error there, right? But why? And the reason is the conservative assumption of the interpreter that this first variable R1 will uh, be alive uh, up to the end of this method. So you also can face with such conservatism problems in your usual code, in your usual JVM like hotspot. But if your code is rather cold and interpreted now. So, in conclusion of my talk, I'd like to say that relying on the life and death of object may be not the bright idea in your Java code. Because, you know, conservative is, uh, you know, GC is rather a complex uh, system, and there are many so corner cases, and it's really hard to predict our actions from our positions of Java developers. So, if you'll try, most probably you'll face with such sporadic and really hard to debug problems as I've uh, just described you. But if, in some reason, you still want to rely on the death of object, please at least use some instruments from JDK instead, instead of self-crafted things. For example, you can use reachability fence method to keep an object alive, or cleaner class um, for clearing low-level resources. And of course, if you rely on the death of the object, do not forget to make a backup uh, pass method like uh, cancel method in timer class. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we'll be happy to answer all your questions. And Благодаря за внимание то.